So moved. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Second. Thank you. Thank you. So approved. Okay. So uh, the other thing we have to announce is uh, both Staley and I are very happy that we, even though unopposed, we were reelected and uh, we will be uh, electing officers uh, for our next meeting. So that will be announced uh, what our roles will be. Anyway, thank you all for your support. And in the meantime, we have Tom Siebens is up first here today from France. Tom, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Welcome. Welcome, Tom. And um, thank you for doing this report on the uh, utility company. Please begin. Um, I suppose the first item is just to update everyone. As you know, on June 5th, there was sort of the town meeting on the long term planning for utility infrastructure modernization. Um, the working group on that is very much focused now on uh, the priority projects for beginning execution of that modernization. Um, the two priority items are replacing four miles of transmission main from top of the world down to Montauk Avenue by the fourth T at Hay Harbor. Um, the second item is a, an additional marine cable um, which has these projects have long lead time um, and so they need a lot of forward planning. Uh, how we finance them is also getting a great deal of attention. Um, we don't have anything quite to announce yet but um, that's where the focus is right now. Obviously there will be many things to be done after those first two projects but addressing those two projects means that anything else we need to do is more manageable. Um, we don't face a catastrophic loss of water or loss of power if we do these two things. Um, otherwise, um, I think there's been a bit of talk around the island about the fact that the electric company has filed for a rate increase that will add $300,000 of revenue to the electric company each year. Um, we need that because the revenue we make from the regulated electric rates um, does not cover our operating costs. With inflation, that's become a more acute problem. Um, so the rate increase was applied for. It's what's called a mini rate case. Um, if you're not asking for more than 300,000 or more re additional annual revenue, um, it's more expedited. Um, some people have seen Groton Utilities announcement that they are going to have a rate decrease. And so we've had the question, well, why are we at adding revenue when we're looking at a rate decrease? Um, the reality of that decrease is really that Groton will be charging less for its um, cost of power which is a pass-through, but some of their fixed charges are going up. So net-net over time, it's not going to result in a huge change in uh, the overall cost of power um, to us. Um, I think the last item to mention is that um, the water company has um, renovated or uh, rejuvenated the church well, which is the one you see on the driving range with that fake rock over the wellhead. Um, that had become uh, clogged and needed to be flushed. Um, but in the process, we discovered the way that that had been put together years ago was kind of a Rubik's cube, um, which made the pumps function inefficiently and ultimately burn out. Um, so that problem has now been fixed, and we're again assured of being able to supply water um, exclusively from wells, uh, which is good news. Um, the Barlow Pond surface water treatment plant will be modernized, and the Barlow Pond water supply is always available, um, but well water is preferable. And that's pretty much it in terms of updates. Do we have any questions from the audience, 
Steely, Caroline. Check. Go ahead, George. Um, am I, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, um, uh, uh, Tom, can you explain a little more why a second cable is a priority? Uh, there is uh, uh, some discussion of the fact that um, if uh, the Pickett Landfill uh, solar project were indeed to materialize uh, and to cover a significant uh, part of the needs of the community with uh, on-island generation, that it might be possible to postpone uh, the second uh, cable. Right. I'm glad you asked that question because there's been, I know, quite a bit of discussion about it. Um, I've discussed it with Brad Burnham a few times. Um, the reality is that um, it sort of boils down to a few factors. The first one is, what are you going to do at night uh, when sun is not generating? Um, what are you going to do during three days of a nor'easter in winter when the sun is not there or the sun angle is low and it's short daylight? Um, some people say, well, we just put a bunch of batteries in, um, but that adds to the cost of the facility. And the reality on Fishers Island is that the cable we have right now is adequate, but with the growth in the electrification of everything and air conditioning, um, we can foresee a time when that cable will begin to run hot it begins to run at over 80% of its rated capacity. And engineers will tell you that causes a, a cable to age more quickly. Um, some people say the solar farm would avoid the cable running hot because when the sun is generating, you could use that energy instead of taxing the cable. But the problem with what they call peak shaving like that is that the peak demand for power on Fisher's Island does not match the peak generating power of a solar farm, which would be middle of the day, whereas peak load on the island is more towards the late afternoon into the evening. So even the peak shaving model, Brad is doing the analysis, but it, it Superficially, it doesn't match up. Um, the other issue we face is um, that a bridge in Groton, which is where our cable lands, and it's at a telephone pole, um, they're repairing, they're going to replace and enlarge the bridge. The Connecticut Department of Transportation has this in the works. That is planned to be done in the summer of 2026. We've talked to the department about what that means for our cable, because they're gonna be widening the waterway under that bridge, which means they will be digging at or very close to where our cable is. They're also talking about moving the telephone pole, which is where our cable comes up and connects to the power line that goes from the shore through Groton utility lines to the substation that connects to the New England grid. But the short answer is that when they do that construction, if they decide they have to disconnect our cable and re-terminate it, it means taking an outage on the island. And maybe it could be planned so it's short. But if something goes wrong, we face an outage for an indeterminate period of time. So this is a concern. If we had a second cable in place by then, we wouldn't have that issue because we'd have a redundant system. The island used to have redundancy. There is a cable that was put in in 1967, um, but it's not, it's half the size of the active cable. It's old, it's armor, it's wrapping is antiquated. 
Um, the engineers can't assure us of its reliability if we were to try to put any load on it. The only useful aspect of that cable is it preserves a right of way where we could put the new cable without having to reapply for permission from Connecticut, New York, the federal government, and so on. So the idea of getting redundancy, given this development with the bridge in Groton, has sort of added pressure to trying to attempt anyway to have a second cable in place. The issue with those cables is it's a one year lead time when you order them. There are very few places they're made anymore. It's Norway, South Korea, or China. Uh, ours would be ordered in Norway. The Wall Street Journal just the other day had an article how that plant is um, running at full capacity because the demand for this kind of cable is rising with the electrification of everything. And so um, we need to plan ahead to be able to at least order the cable and hopefully give us a shot at putting it in before the Groton Bridge works begin. But back to your original point about solar, um, we haven't really got to the point where you could be sure you could build a solar generation facility with batteries that's large enough to power the island to a significant degree. And Brad is still trying to figure out the economics of whether it even makes sense to put one on the picket landfill. Um, and, you know, it's great that he's doing that analysis, but um, the jury's still out on that. So I'm sorry to go on a bit, but I hope that at least gives some um, clarity to the question. Well, if I could just follow up, um, I... I, uh, I uh, appreciate uh, everything you're saying and obviously uh, uh, that's important there's a price tag to this uh second cable which is quite substantial and and um uh the uh, uh what uh, one uh, in infers is that uh, it would have to be paid with rate increases uh, so that's also a consideration is uh, uh, on the other side of the equation, uh, the cost of, of uh, building this second cable now. Well, correct. Um, the, on the only way we have um, identified to mitigate that cost is to um, get funding support from the federal government. Um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture operates uh, what used to be the Rural Elect Electrification Administration, which was set up during the New Deal to bring power to remote farms and rural areas. They still run that program. It's a program that provides long-term debt at low interest. So if you have to finance a project like this, the way to mitigate rate increases is to finance it in a way that spreads the cost over the longest period you can at the lowest interest rate. Um, and that's the plan. The reality is we don't really have a choice if we want redundancy, and a reliable connection to the mainland, which connects us to the New England grid, which has a whole array of power sources from hydro to wind to solar to gas fired and so forth. Um, so we are very aware of the impact on rates. And it's one of the things we look at when we're planning for how we finance this. Um, it doesn't mean it, it will mean a rate increase, but we're not trying to fix everything in the electrical system at one go. Um, we're just trying to fix this initial piece, which gives us the security that then we can deal with the sub pieces that are on the island. Tom, would you say is this um, submarine uh, cable, is that the first item on your agenda going forward with the infrastructure project? Well, 
Yes, that and the four mile of transmission main. Uh, the reason is if we were to lose a connection, if that cable that we have were to somehow fail, um, there's no electricity on the island and there's no water because the water depends on electric pumps. Um, Martha's Vineyard lost one of its four cables back in 2020. Uh, Nantucket lost a cable, one of its two cables, um, in April this year. So these cables do fail for different reasons. Um, and redundancy is important. Um, to try to run the island off the CMAC generator is horrifically expensive, um, probably couldn't be done. People that have their own emergency generators probably couldn't get enough fuel on the ferry to keep them going. Um, so these cables are really kind of critical to making sure we don't face a catastrophic loss of power. Can I ask one question, John? Please. Um, Tom, first of all, in the comments, uh, Willard has thanked you very much for an excellent detailed answer to George's question. Um, and my question is, do you think, would we be, would the utility company be eligible for U.S. Department of Agriculture low interest loan because we're a private company? We've talked to them about that and yes. Okay. Um, it's, it, uh, it's a good question. Um, but there is a way to uh, comply with their requirement that you are basically not profit. Great, thank you. And then there is a question in the comments. Has any testing been done on secondary cable? Can testing be done? Um, we've talked to the engineers about doing that. Um, they have said, among other things, that you could damage the cable because the way you do it is you just start putting more and more juice through it. And you might reach the point where suddenly it stops taking the load that you're putting on it. And that could end up creating a failure. This is a 57 year old piece of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing about testing it is Groton has said there's a switch connection at the Groton end of that that is an antique. And they do not wanna be connecting their power generating system to that old cable without first replacing that piece of engineering. So you would end up to do this, to even test it, you'd have to invest in fixing that part of it. And then you'd have to run the test. And then even if it could take some load, it probably would only be the winter load at most. And so it's of marginal use for the big picture problem. And the punchline from the engineers was you're better off spending your money doing the work to um, prepare for and install a, a brand new cable. Okay, thank you, Tom. Anybody else for, any other questions for Tom? Well, Tom, thank you. I know we, we kept you up there over there in France. I hope you're enjoying right. it. And Happy really, to do it. I'm sorry? Happy to do it. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Um, next on our agenda, we have Beth Cashel, who's going to talk about uh, her, give her South Hill report and zoning report. Beth, you yeah, there? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, thank you John. Um, as uh, many of you know, and many attended, uh, the town official day was last week, um, at which time uh, we, um, the many Fishers Island members, had the opportunity to listen to the town uh, board meeting, also meet with officials. Uh, there was a zoning presentation by Heather Lanza, who is the town planning director, on the project currently underway in the rezoning of the town of Southhold, which involves Fishers Island. And um, just to sort of briefly speak about the zoning, since I just mentioned it. So the zoning committee, which there is a subcommittee, and then there is a committee in the town, um, and there is also a consultant. The town of Southhold is in the process of utilizing the Southhold Comprehensive Plan 
to uh, rezone or look at the current zoning of the town of Southhold and, um, and update it. So that is in the process. The timeline that was presented, which I think is helpful for everyone to understand, is currently it's being looked at from a townwide through these uh, little subcommittees. The consultant are looking at all the information and they will be presenting in the fall their initial ideas which then will once again bring forth a town conversation and feedback opportunity. As everyone will remember, Heather was here and did a workshop with us in the winter, presented what the town zoning is and what the, what the project is. Will again, uh, be opportunity for feedback. Additionally, the subcommittee that Fishers are made up of Fishers Island representatives, they'll be putting forth a presentation to the community so we can get feedback from you to send to the consultants in the town prior to them presenting uh, to us in the fall. Um, next, um, a few other things that happened when they did come on Wednesday, the town engineer, the town superintendent of highways, and the town supervisor and an outside engineer went to look at the seawall um, by Wild Things, uh, which, as you know, that road has not uh, been able to be used for, I think, a year, maybe it's almost two years. Um, and apparently there is an issue as to whether or not there is enough space to replace the road and sidewalk. So currently they are discussing the options and they will be um, laid out before the community before action is taken. So that's where that project is. Um, additionally, uh, a, a year ago, as you all will recall, there was a town housing plan um, that was presented that also corresponded with that 0.05% transfer tax but now uh, the planning department is working on some more specifics and they would like to do a presentation to the Fishers Island community about how that money can be used, especially on Fishers Island and also answer questions. As you will remember, and I was on that housing planning advisory committee, uh, we did make sure uh, that there were ways in which Fishers Island could utilize those funds and made sure that within that plan that was available. However, I think at this point, now that funds are being allocated to that fund, we on Fishers Island should know how we can allocate and utilize those funds here on the island. Um, there is also a new draft of the tree code that's coming to the town board. Um, and so we'll be sending that to you as soon as it's available, but it's something to look uh, look forward to and to just pay attention to, to see if that has any effect to any of us here on Fishers. The town board also met with the short-term rental task force um, and they had done a presentation uh, which actually, if you go on to the town uh, site, today is Tuesday, there was, there's a working committee, uh, there's a working meeting that happens on in the mornings before a, plan, uh, a town board meeting. And so you probably can get a, a, a copy of that to look at it. But what they were doing is um, basically the Fishers Island doesn't really come under the town short-term rental law as there are no rentals under two weeks, officially that is, I guess. But as you know, permits are required for rentals um, now. So we may want to sort of pay attention to how that may or may not be applying to us in the future. As any of us who were at the board meeting know, there were $500,000 worth of bonds approved for Fishers Island sidewalks. We're not sure about the timing or when the work will be done, but it's really important to know um, that through the work and the um, the really great um, advocacy that many people, particularly Gordon Murphy have been doing, we are now getting $500,000 worth of bonds for our Fishers Island sidewalks. Uh, we understand that that is not going to do many of our sidewalks, but it is a step in the right direction. 
Um, the other thing that um, came up, as many of you might have heard or witnessed if you were at the town board meeting, was about the road to the transfer station. The town's position, um, and this information I'm, I'm giving to you now is um, via Louisa. The town's position is twofold. Quote, it is not considered a town road because it is not on the town road inventory as it has not been brought up to the standards needed to be considered a town road and therefore maintained by the town as a road. Quote, also, the town owns the road, but the ferry district manages the property. Continuing the quote, the condition of the road was not an issue until the ferry district started renting out property to the Fishers Island Waste Management District and then contractors, um, and thus increasing traffic on the road, end of quote. Um, so that um, is uh, from the town on, on that particular uh, situation. So I think also if you were at the town meeting, you know that they also there's not lights on that main road down on the Fort Road. That is being fixed. We had five thousand dollars approved for solar lights, so the lighting will uh, also be fixed, hopefully um, uh, shortly. And that's it, John. So, so Beth, this this road to the dump, um, the, the bulls back in the ferry district's court. Is that the idea that they know how to deal with it? because the town doesn't want to deal with it. I think if you read the quote from Louisa, that's what we hear. Yes. Okay, so we have to talk John, to John. This is yes. Go ahead. John, Bob. this is Willard. Yeah. Okay. Two hey, Willard. two comments. Yeah, thank you. Two comments, uh Beth, thank you for the for the detailed update. One is um relative to the zoning and the comprehensive plan. Meg may remember this and certainly Nate Malinowski does, but approximately six years ago when we got the um, dra the final draft, the draft for comments of the comprehensive plan, the ICB uh, did a pretty thorough uh, review of the plan and sent the town comments, which the town totally ignored. They did not respond in any way. Um, that means they didn't say thank you for the comments. We're not going to implement it. They just ignored everything we said. So um, using the comprehensive plan as the basis for zoning it, um, changes or rules for Fishers Island may, may be fine, but it may not be. And I think that at least um, the work that was done and Louise is aware of the work that was done uh, and I would say it was five, six, seven years ago um, on this, um, should be dusted off and looked at. Um, and the town should be reminded that they got communication from us on comments about the comprehensive plan that we thought weren't applicable to Fisher's Island, even though so, they, yeah. it was Fisher's Island. So yeah. I appreciate those comments, Willard. And just uh, so you know, uh, we, in fact, on this subcommittee uh, went back farther than even the Yale study, but more importantly, to your point, in 2015, if that's what you're speaking of, there was yep. a, a group uh, who put together a very exhaustive research and Heather came over from the meetings. Is that what you're speaking about? That was one. And then again, I think it was six or seven years ago, um, uh, we did it again. Right. So we, yes, we but 2000, we, I was involved in both of those. Right. So we went back to all the historical information. And in fact, much of what the uh, consultants were working on was all of that information. So the subcommittee has taken all that committee. And actually what we were trying to do is, is working from the work that has been previously done by you and the group of Fishers Island, but updating that. So that information okay. is being used. And if I may say, we're going to present this to everyone so everyone understands. And 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 the zoning, and they came over and uh, at our request, in fact, we had the consultant 
and the town um, two weeks ago here doing an incredible, a wonderful tour and conversation. And um, with the, the subcommittee, again, making sure all of you understand that that subcommittee is not reinventing a wheel. All the information is really going back to all the historical work all of you incredible volunteers have done and just sort of up, updating it and reminding uh, the town. But we got them here to, and we went from section to section. I think you remember, Willard, how you had all yeah. those sections. Yeah. We went to each of those sections and discussed them. So the consultant wasn't looking at a map, but they were looking at the real thing and they were hearing from people on Fishers. And also, mm -hmm. if you remember, Heather also months ago had a working session where we, we had um, breakout rooms and a zoning where then everyone on the community could speak to, to them to get our opinion. So I, I feel that they are listening and, and hearing, but in no way would uh, any of this zoning is going to happen without everyone having input in it. And um, But please know we are using it. And I will ask again, um, and, and Louisa knows about it, but I'll ask about the eight to nine years ago, because I want to I wanna understand what that document might have, just to make sure that it's in our it's being sent okay. to that we're looking at it. Thank but, you. Thank and you. my second my my second comment, John, if I might, was your summary of um, the issue with the road to uh, wait the waste management road or the road um, yeah. down to the transfer station. Um, this is the line that the town of Southold has had for the last six or eight years. Every um, I have emails back from uh, Scott Russell where he said not a town road, same exact things that um, Elizabeth just mentioned, not a town road, not on the town map. Talk to the ferry district. Ferry district tries to talk to the town about it. They get nowhere with the town. Um, this is just um, the same old, same old. So I don't know how you break this pattern, but it's been a pattern um, from the town for at least seven or eight years. I well, think uh, I yeah. think that the pattern is that the ferry is now now talking to waste management. There's more of a conversation between waste management and the ferry because there's conversations that waste management might move their their facility, and the concern is if we fix the road at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and then the ferry moves. Then so I uh, the waste management moves and should the waste management pay? So I think there's some conversations at the ferry um, ferry district level that I I will bounce that maybe we should hear from them on this subject. Yeah, yep, we'll, we'll I agree. We'll, we'll speak to Jeb about that. Also, okay, I wanted, wait, excuse I me. Wanted, um, go ahead. Meg Atkin has her hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who volunteers and gives their time, but especially to Beth, who gives such good and clear reports um, on the ICB meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. I wanted to say, too, that I, w I was able to uh, drive the, com the comptroller around uh, from Southhold uh, during the meeting last week, and uh, we need her cooperation if we were to do another study, financial study that was originally uh, funded by Peter Brinkerhoff 10 years ago, where we're trying to uh, delineate exactly what we pay to Southhold in taxes and what we get back. So that's a, that's a project that we might be very well doing, but we need the cooperation of the comptroller and she's agreed to work with us. So I wanted to tell you that. Um, that's good. <laughs> Um, I, also, I have know, a with, there's yeah, a question for Beth here in the comments. Um, somebody said, you know, do you what is the town's plan for improving the roads? Okay, you answered that. But then he says, what is the process for Fisher's Island to have input to any future plans? Maybe you input can on me, what and what? And I'm input sorry, input on what? how things should be improved, in, like infrastructure, like roads and sidewalks. Well, I hope that person who wrote that came to the meeting and, and spoke, because that would be one way is to show up and speak up. Um, and so in towns, um, I think uh, speaking and, and, and showing up at the town is the best thing that Fishers Island can do um, to, to get our points across. And I think Gordon Murphy 
is a has a is the chair of the committee of ICB on town. So I think reaching out to him would be really helpful too. I think that's a that's a great idea, Beth. Yeah, because Gordon is really on top of this, and he's. Uh, it's not like we haven't been talking to the town regularly. We just haven't gotten their money yet. But I think that latest development, that five hundred thousand dollars, that's a po pretty positive sign, right? From last it is. Week. I mean, you know, we know a mile costs a million dollars or something crazy like that, but it's $500,000. Right. Right, right. Well, good. I, well, listen, that, I think there's a question on the DMV, yeah. if I may. Yeah. Answer. Yes, so, there's a question on the DMV. So the DMV, um, we have gotten our civil service um, statements because you need it to be a civil service job for assistance to be hired to do it. The state of New York has, we have all the equipment, it is here. We just have to hire people. They have given us the, the final, just in the last month, the final titles that allows it to be done, but the budget hasn't been budgeted. So uh, unbeknownst to me, because a while ago, um, I sent them the number and the budget, it's not that much, to staff these people. And um, I was told the other day that they didn't have the budget. So I'm sending them the new budget and we have to get that approved. But in the fall, we can't sort of hire people who have five different jobs when and most of their jobs are in the summer. They need to be trained. It is a 40 hour commitment of training for the DMVs. So we're waiting to the fall in the winter when they have when people have more time to be trained. Um, so we're hoping that it will be up and running by winter. And um, and the training is just very involved and requires a lot of sacrifice for, for people. But I did negotiate that they do not have to spend 40 hours in White Plains, that the majority of the training will get done via Zoom, but there will still be one day. And they're like eight hour days, but I negotiated that so it could be maybe four hours over an extended period of time so people wouldn't be losing their other jobs to have this 10 hour a month job. Um, and I also just wanted to update on the state police. The state police, um, I had questioned at the town meeting, uh, no one seems to know what's going on, but then I was approached by the town lawyer as well as the state police. And apparently there are active negotiations between the town and the, and the New York State Police to determine who's coming back. Is it going to be town or is it going to be state police? How will the state police barracks be utilized? And once they know if it will be office or housing, then they will know how to uh, refurbish it. And so that is at the town and state level in negotiations. And so we have no further information, but we do know that we will have police. We just don't know um, which ones, how many, and where they will be working and living at this point. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, as always, for your diligence. You have got a lot on your plate. We appreciate everything you're doing for us. But anyway, thank you. Uh, next up, we have Dave Congdon for Walsh Park. Dave, you there? Uh, yes, John. Thanks very much for, for having Walsh Park on. Um, I know I know a lot of you on the phone, uh, but the many I probably don't know. Um, so I'm Dave Congdon. I'm the new president of, of Walsh Park. I've taken over leadership um, uh, from Ned, Ned Carlson and Andrew Burr, who have been doing it as co-presidents for at least 10 years. Uh, they will remain on the board. Um, uh, they're not leaving Walsh Park at all, but they will just uh, take a little less active role. Also on the call with me is Matt Edwards, uh, Walsh Park's program manager. He's our only employee and, uh, and certainly manages and touches everything. Uh, Walsh Park, and I'll get I'll cover more of what that means a little bit later. So I wanted to try to cover sort of three main areas, um, give you some important facts to to kind of frame what frame the question: What is Walsh Park? Uh, covering kind of the pro our properties, how how we run it, or how it's run, and our finances, uh, as well as what it means to Fisher's Island, uh, and close uh, with our our uh, strategic priorities as, as we see them today. So starting off um, with uh, kind of what is Walsh Park, our mission statement, you can read this on our website as well. Walsh Park promotes the viability 
of the Fishers community by creating and maintaining an ample supply of housing for year round residents who are active contributing members of the community. So the, the mission statement's really twofold, uh, provide housing to year round residents who are also uh, contributing members of the community. So as, as you may not know, but we in Walt Park enjoys a wide demographic amongst its residents. And we interpret the words contributing to the community, you know, fairly broadly. Um, for example, participating in any island organization counts, but so does performing a service outside of one's primary job, helping on issues that are relevant to the island, uh, holding a part-time job in retirement. Uh, I can probably, you know, go on with a few more examples, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, the gist of the mission statement or the concept, the important concept to remember is, is that uh, we ask Walsh Park residents to participate in whatever interest um, they have um, to contribute to the community in some way. And we feel the more, basically we feel more participation across our uh, community is, is, is the best for fishers. So um, what is and who is Walsh Park today? Uh, I'm gonna run through about five, five or six of some of the most important highlights. Um, um, it, it, pretty briefly, um, today, Walt Park Properties house about 80, 85 people from school-aged kids through retirees or part-time uh, workforce participants. That equates to roughly 80, uh, roughly 30 percent of Fisher's estimated year-round population. So it's a significant amount. Um, secondly, Walt Park. A little bit of history. Walsh Park originated in the early 1990s um, and with the Sanger Fund purchased land that Walsh Park entitled, brought in utilities and built the Peters Way Road, road to accommodate 12 new homes. And those 12 new homes were purchased and are owned by the occupants in those homes. Walsh Park retains ownership of the land uh, of each home under a long-term lease with each of those homeowners. Since the early 90s, um, Walsh Park has uh, acquired property, uh, and in one case, redeveloped the property to include uh, the following. Three multifamily apartment buildings with a total of 14 apartment building, apartment units, sorry. These are at the, on the second floor of the freight building, what we call the parade ground apartments, um, which are across from the movie theater, a two-story building, and uh, uh, an attached uh, multi-unit building on Madeline Avenue. Additionally, we have nine single-family homes and two small commercial buildings, uh, the commercial buildings being located on Montauk Avenue, adjacent to the Pequot. Those buildings are used by small businesses like independent carpenters or contractors and a creative arts professional. And finally, among our own properties, there's a land parcel that's located between Whistler and Winthrop Avenues that's entitled for four single family homes and was acquired uh, essentially last year after uh, a significant effort uh, by Walsh Park and, and uh, communication and negotiation with the community and the town to get that um, entitled uh, for the four single family homes uh, that can be could be built in the future. These collection of owned properties we call our 100% owned properties that are owned in land and the improvements are owned by Walsh Park and are leased to the Fishers Island residents that that commit to, to participate in the community. Pictures, uh, details of these properties can be found on our website. And I'd encourage you, if you have further interest, uh, to peruse our website. It's got a lot of good information on there. Um, a word about demand, Walsh Park uh, has enjoyed since my, uh, going back several years uh, I've been, that I've been on the board, but even before that, we enjoy robust demand, 100% of our owned units, uh, and to my knowledge, uh, also the, the Peters Way uh, houses are all 100% uh, leased and occupied. Um, 
And over the last few years, we've had a waiting list of four to five applicants uh, regularly on the waiting list. With respect to our rents, uh, we, we, do, we do not set our, set our rents arbitrarily. We have a system for it. Uh, we base the rents that we set on our own properties uh, on the United States Housing and Urban Development or HUD index for the uh, New London Norwich region. That index is annually published by the department, by the HUD department. And using that index, we set our rents at a discount uh, of between 10 and 30% of the rate of change in that index annually. The degree of discount is, is subjectively set and it's based on uh, the size, the age, uh, and the condition of the home or apartment unit. Um, uh, the last point about our portfolio, and this is important, uh, apart from the six apartment units, uh, which were were um, developed, if you redeveloped in on the second floor of the freight building some six or seven or eight years ago, they're fairly new. Uh, the remaining part of our portfolio, the homes and the multi and the other multifamily buildings are what I would call older, and therefore uh, require both. Uh, recurring repairs and maintenance, and in many cases, capital replacement. Um, given that the average age of these buildings and that Walsh Park acquired many of these assets with occupants in place, uh, items like replacement for roofs or siding or windows or, or even a replacement of appliances are necessary in, in many of our homes, we've got, for example, five homes identified where we, we do need to uh, replace the windows on. They, they're, they're at the end of their useful lives and, and uh, they're in need of replacement. So some comments about our organization, how Walsh Park runs, uh, our people and our financial profile. Uh, we have a really lean organization. As I mentioned, Matt is our only employee at present. He's the program manager. He wears many hats and has overall, overall responsibility for managing our 25 owned units. Some examples of what he does, he coordinates service calls with tenants for repairs and maintenance. Um, he manages the interview process and tenant move-ins and tenant move-outs. Uh, he prepares our records, processes rent payments, pays bills, manages vendors, and communicates and works with our board and the, and the subcommittees on our board. It's a lot of work for one person. Um, given the size of our portfolio and, and uh, uh, the condition of some of the properties, we're, we're seeking to hire a handyman uh, with solid carpentry and related skills that can help us more efficiently tackle the regular R&M work and also help us plan and supervise some of the larger uh, capital replacement projects that I referred to earlier. Um, our board is uh, consists of 14 members, six, six of them are year round residents. We're all uh, named on the website, so take a look if you're curious. With respect to our finances and our financial profile, um, I'll make this uh, point a different way. It's an important point uh, to understand is that because our rents are set below market, um, uh, the lease revenues can, in some years, be less than operating expenses. When we, particularly in years when we have significant repair and maintenance or capital improvement work to, uh, to uh, pay for. So when deficits occur, uh, we rely mostly on our annual fundraising to cover these deficits. Um, in addition to our cash on hand, we also have an endowment uh, it's the Frank Burr Endowed Fund, which currently stands at about $175,000. Obviously, that's invested, um, and the income from that fund, endowed fund, also contributes to uh, to our uh, our funding needs to uh, invest in our existing portfolio. Our fundraising drive starts in early November of each year. Over the past several years, we typically receive contributions from about 200 individuals and entities like foundations, which is wonderful. Uh, I encourage you to give generously, of course, but I most importantly thank all of you uh, for your loyal support. 
However, I would make this point as well. Uh, it's evident that our existing financial resources and level of fundraising is somewhat of a constraint on how much we can invest in our portfolio, uh, given the size of it today um, and, and the condition of some of the properties. Uh, and certainly it's, it's a constraint on our ability uh, to uh, add additional housing uh, to the Fisher's inventory. So with respect to going forward and our priorities, um, our first priority, um, and we, we, the board has been uh, aware of this for some time, nonetheless, it continues to be, because uh, I think we've made some progress, but there's still progress left. And that's in the area of, of improving the condition uh, of our existing uh, portfolio of single family homes and, uh, and two of the uh, multifamily properties that I referred to earlier. We've made progress in the recent past, but we've got more to do given the age of our portfolio. A good example of our progress um, is our three, three unit multifamily building on Madeline Avenue. Uh, some highlights from that effort over the past several years. In the last year, we replaced the roof, flashings, trim, siding, and insulation around the windows. And the windows were replaced a couple of years before that. Uh, and we replaced the fire escape stair. Um, Fishers Island based contractors, Stoke um, Roofing and Siding, and Lusker and Spofford, Spofford um, completed this work for us. So we, we thank them for that effort. Also, we've renovated the inside of two of the three units in that building um, uh, over the past three to four years. And the most recent one, Dirk Harris, uh, completed uh, Unit 2 um, last year. The aggregate cost of all that work uh, that I just referenced in that one building is, is around $300,000. So it's a sizable amount, and it gives you, uh, I think, a good uh, uh, benchmark to uh, consider when, when, when I just listed, you know, three multifamily buildings, nine single-family homes, uh, that are in the portfolio. Um, obviously, that relates to the second priority that we have, which is to strengthen our financial resources. Uh, I mentioned that our annual fund is critical to this effort to, to uh, improve our portfolio and to pay our yearly cost of operation uh, when our lease revenues are, are not enough. Uh, as important as that, though, we need to build our endowment to where its earnings can contribute more to our annual operations and capital, requirement, and capital requirements when they occur. Given the size of our portfolio, uh, my personal view is that we need an, a, an appropriate endowment amount about three to four times the current level. A word about uh, a relatively new effort. We're not relying, we're not trying to rely solely on uh, Islanders' personal generosity. Um, about 12 months ago, we've been working on additional sources of funding. Um, you heard in the utility um, discussion by Tom Stevens, um, we're looking at also, we're also looking at the federal government. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, starting with the state government and speaking to the New York State Department of Energy Research and Development Agency, which administers uh, a lot of New York state funds, but also uh, federal funds under the Inflation Reduction Act that are, uh, that are used for housing and specifically energy related improvements uh, for housing. Um, which we, 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 many of our properties could use. Uh, Jim, Jim Ingram and George D. Manil, who heads up the Fishers Island Fund have been instrumental in helping us get this effort off the ground. So stay tuned with that. Um, if we can achieve the first two priorities, um, our residents will live in better apartments and homes, and Walsh Park will be in a much better position to deliver some additional inventory, um, re residential inventory through the development of our land parcel uh, in the medium term future. Um, I hope this uh, has informed you a bit. Um, I encourage you to ask any questions. Um, uh, Walsh Park is an important uh, organization to the Fishers community, and I think one that helps make our, our community uh, unique. So 
Thanks for your time and patience. Thanks, John. Thank um, you very much. Just Dave. one comment in the um, in the chat, Dave, and it, it's um, has Walsh Park investigated how to access the funds coming out of the 0.05 percent of the Peconic Bay tax, and this is coming from Beth, so she's giving you the email address of the planner, which I just texted to you separately in case you want to reach out. But Great. Question, uh, question and a comment. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we, it's on our radar screen. We have not uh, begun to investigate it yet, but it's a, it's a great suggestion and, and we will do it. Thanks. Any other questions for Dave? Very good. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks for all your work. The Walsh Park is so important to our community and I'm sure yeah, that this will continue. Go and ahead, there sir. is there is one more comment. Sorry, excuse me for interrupting. Mm -hmm. um, it's from Beth, and I can re reiterate this also because I'm on the North Fork Civic Association. So many of these towns and hamlets in Southhold use Fishers Island Walsh Park as an exemplary example of how to create community housing. They talk about it all the time in these meetings, and they are so... Um, they have great admiration for what we've done here and they're incredibly sort of envious that they their communities don't have the generosity with which to create a Walsh Park in their own community. So I think that's a real tribute to what Walsh Park has done and to our community for being so generous. Thank you, Sally. And thank you, Dave. Uh, next up, to finish, finish off the meeting, we have Jeb Cook and Russ Piper going to give a Harbor report. Jeb and Russ. Uh, thank you, John. Today I come to you with my, uh, as chairman of the Harbor Committee. Um, I'll start off with all waters adjacent to Fishers Island fall under the jurisdiction of the town of Southhold. Policies governing use and regulations have been established by the town appointed Fishers Island Harbor Committee to ensure an enjoyable experience for all who live, work, and visit the waters surrounding Fishers Island. Working in conjunction with the Fish Fishers Island Civic Association, a precursor to the ICB, the Harbor Committee was established in the early 1990s to make the transition from a town appointed Harbor Master to a town appointed stakeholder style committee. The stakeholder groups included on the committee are the Fire Department, Island People's Project, the Conservancy, Aquaculture Interests, Pirates Cove Marine, Goose Island Corp, the Yacht Club, Hay Harbor Club, Fishers Island Club, FIDCO, and property owners from East, West, and Hay Harbors. Members are appointed to a five-year term with options to renew. The committee meets twice a year prior to and after the boating season. The purpose of the Harbor Committee is to recommend policies for management of all waters bounding Fishers Island from the mean high water mark to a distance of 1,500 feet from shore. We develop a management plan for West Harbor, including setting a mooring grid and anchorage areas, speed and wake zones, liveaboard policies, et cetera. We oversee annual mooring applications and permitting process. The committee grapples with issues such as providing pump out services, shellfish, shellfish bed closures, congestion in East Harbor, anchoring in seagrass beds off the eighth hole beach at the East End, and use of the town, uh, also use of the South Old Town Dock in West Harbor, water skiing in Hay Harbor, tracking dock permits, etc. It's a volunteer committee that has operated for over three decades and has been chaired by myself, L.B. Burr, and originally Leslie Goss. There have been three different administrators over the years and several Bay constables who are known as Bay Patrol. They also receive an annual stipend from the town. One of our biggest challenges is enforcement of our town adopted rules and regulations. Our Bay Patrol people this year, and this year is it's Russ Piper and Jonathan Farrar. Are, they're only able to ask voters to cooperate with the rules. They cannot issue tickets or take enforcement actions. They are primarily patrolling West Harbor, moving boats out of channels or keeping them off private moorings or from anchoring in the wrong location overnight. 
They occasionally get over to Hay Harbor if there's an issue there. It takes a bit of time and gas to get up to East Harbor, which has been seeing over 100 boats crammed in on several weekend afternoons this summer. The state troopers have been helpful in the past, but they aren't allowed to enforce local ordinances, such as noise ordinance, like loud music or parties on a boat after 10 p.m. The recent arrival of town, South Old Town Police is encouraging, but they don't have a boat. We are working with Louisa to try and get some enforcement of some pretty well thought out rules. With, a, with that overview provided, now I'd like to ask Russ Piper to share what he does and some observations and statistics. We're happy to answer any questions after Russ speaks. Russ, you on? Hey, Russ. I'm here. Good. All right, so it's been a busy summer as it usually is. Uh, the one thing I will say, South Hold does have a police boat. They just don't keep it out here. Um, so they do have one. I've seen it in the harbor a couple of times, uh, but they don't stay for very long when they show up. They just go pass through. Um, I don't know if we can ask them to come out here more often and go down to East Harbor uh, and deal with some of the issues down there. That would be great. Uh, as Jeb said, we, we don't have any enforcement capability. Um, there's contradictory language between the contract that they give us from the town and the harbor uh, rules that uh, have been around for several decades at this point. Um, so at this point, we, we can invite the police to come with us, and if they want to, they can. Uh, so a couple of things uh, that we've been dealing with is, one, as uh, Jeff had said, there's no anchoring inside um, the Red Nun number eight in the Inner Harbor, and we get people coming in and doing that on a regular basis that we have to go get out of here and get to move. Also, people who are beaching their boats inside of eight, um, we we have to deal with that from time to time. We're also um, working with the uh, shellfish closure issue, uh, and we're doing Y valve inspections and holy tank inspections on boats um, were in order to change the policy back to October 1st instead of November 1st, starting the shellfish season. We have to do 10 inspections, five in July, five in August. And so far, I've done the five in July. I have two scheduled for this weekend, and I expect to get the other, well, the entire five done by the middle of next week. So we should hopefully uh, be in a good position to um, get the shellfish season extended a month as it has been in the past. Um, we also uh, have an issue with people um, going much over the five mile an hour speed limit inside the harbor. There's a huge difference in your wake between five and 10 miles an hour. And so that's something we're trying to work on and also continually get um, updates about people speeding past the, the designated beach areas. And there is a rule uh, for the designated beach areas um, that you cannot operate uh, within 50 feet of a designated beach or a swimmer or a boat that's moored or anchored uh, at more than five miles an hour. And you're not supposed to go more than five miles an hour within a hundred feet of shore. And if you're coming into shore, you're supposed to do it at a perpendicular angle angle to the shore. So those are some issues. I get regular pictures sent to me, uh, especially on the south side of the island, which we do not patrol, um, but over by Isabel, I guess it's very common problem out there that people are tearing right through the beach area on their boats. Um, so that's what I have. Anybody have any questions for me? Any questions out there for Russ or Jeff? Yeah, you will or stand up. Yeah, I have one. Um, have has there been any effort to get um some of those white no wake buoys um uh, South Hold or whoever puts them up like they have on the Connecticut side? Um, uh, it seems to me that um if we had those out past the red nun it it may help reduce the amount of um 
speeders <laughs> coming into the harbor. We have one just past it on the port side of the channel and one just inside of it on the starboard side of the channel. Really? I've yep. never they noticed. Look, they look a lot like the no anchoring ones. Okay. Maybe we need a bigger one that's more. Maybe noticed. we do. Yeah. We did just replace 12 of those markers, various markers this past winter. Yeah, I think we need I think we need bigger ones then, um, uh, because um, I I don't I I know that we have the little white ones and I know there's some of those up by the east end for on this for in the seagrass beds, but um, I I'm referring to the big ones like when you're going into the Mystic River there um, just at the mouth of the Mystic River that it's a much bigger uh, buoy. It is a bigger buoy, it, it, but they're this they do say no wake five mile an hour on the two that are there, but I don't think anybody, they're not as prominent as the ones that are over in Mystic for sure. And I just saw uh, a um, note about reporting people anchoring in the seagrass beds inside eight. Uh, absolutely, you can reach out to me or Jonathan and we'll go out there and chase them out. We do it all the time. So. Well, thank you. Anybody else for Russ or Jeb? Okay. Well, thank you very much for everyone, everyone participating and um, have a very nice evening and see wait, you. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, sorry. I got, I've got one question here. Sorry. Uh, this is for Russ. Should we report to you when we see Connecticut motorboats parked just off Dock Beach to collect clams yep. and other shellfish? Yeah, he, he yeah. just said. Oh, sorry. Well, sorry, and sorry. Not, well that, that's a slightly different question. Uh, there is no shellfishing inside number eight until... Right now it's November first, so if oh, they're clamming, right. they're not supposed to be clamming. We're okay. not, we're not actually the shellfish warden. I don't know. Do we have a shellfish warden, Jeff? No, no. So we'll go chase it out. <laughs> okay, good to know. Thank you, right. Jeb. One quick question: Has that Coast Guard house uh, is that finalized yet? No, it uh, it's supposed to close tomorrow. There's active uh, bidding going on as we speak. Okay. Thank you. So you'll report when we yeah, find it. Right? I will. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice evening. Appreciate it. Bye. <clears throat> Bye.